Good afternoon, everyone. Let's start our after lab tonight. So today I'm very pleased to welcome Anu Jalais for our casual French after lab meeting. So I'm Aurélie Martin from the French Chamber of Commerce, and I'm pleased to introduce our after lab of tonight, making ethnographic sense, sense of beasts people and white environments. French Lab Singapore is a joint initiative by CNRS, Ambassade de France and the French Chamber of Commerce in Singapore. So we have a few, role, few rules before we start. First, please note that this presentation is recorded. If you have any question, please ask your question in the Q&A box or raise your hand and we will be happy to see you and you can ask your question directly to Anu. And also please note that at the end of the presentation, if you have any question, we will again ask Ask you to raise your hand or to put uh, your mic and um, yes enjoy the after lab and also i would like also to thank you again anu for this presentation and the team so let's start anu uh, it's for you now thank you thank you so much Aurélie. thank you for inviting me i'm uh, really grateful to uh, the cnrs uh, the, the french embassy in singapore the french chamber of commerce and the french lab uh, for having made this possible, for organizing everything so well. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about my work in general, because um, as this was a casual talk, I thought I shouldn't go too deep into uh, very many, um, you know, theoretical issues. And I'm just going to give you an overview of what I do. And, um, you are welcome to stop me if uh, there are questions um, that you absolutely need to ask. Otherwise, uh, I'll be done in, in 30 minutes and we can then have a, a Q&A. Um, so I'm an assistant professor at the National University of Singapore. And uh, I've been working on the non-human for a couple of decades now. Um, and it all started with uh, the Schundorborn. So I'm going to uh, tell you where the Schundorborn is. So the Schundorborn is this, um, it's the biggest mangrove forest in the world. It's in the south of Bangladesh and West Bengal in India. And it is the, the only reason very often people have, no, people have heard about this region is that uh, they have, they have uh, come across stories about tigers. And uh, the very interesting uh, part about these tigers is that they're, they're considered to be man-eaters. Um, so I grew up in Kolkata, which is about a hundred kilometers away from uh, the Shundurbon, uh, this whole region. So it's, it's, it's a forested region as well as towards the north, it's inhabited. And it's a very uh, peculiar kind of place, a place where um, when you, you know, when you want to inhabit one of these islands, uh, this island has to be made um, habitable by a mud wall. So every island in, the, in southern Bengal, basically, both Bangladesh and West Bengal, are surrounded by big mud walls. And the problem is that very often these mud walls uh, get um, washed away by uh, cyclones or s simply just you know, have breaches because of crabs. And, and then you have uh, salt water entering these islands and it makes it very difficult for people to cultivate anything for the next three to five years. So I had gone to the Shundarbon as a child because I grew up, as I said, in Kolkata. And I returned there as a high school student. And when I went there as a high, high school student in the late 80s, um, we were told by some scientists that um, these tigers were very peculiar tigers and that they attacked from the back. And so the government had now decided to um, give the islanders some masks to wear at the back of their heads so that when the tiger saw, you know, this, this uh, masked person would not know how to attack and therefore would just leave the person. Uh, and so the government had distributed all these masks um, to the islanders. And the scientists were telling us that 
Unfortunately, uh, the islanders were so superstitious that they preferred to believe in this uh, forest goddess called Bondidi rather than wearing those masks. And I remember, um, you know, asking one of those guards very early the next morning uh, with a friend, I said, you know, we are not superstitious. We we'll wear these masks. Can you give us a couple of them? And we would like to visit the forest and see, um, you know, and, and basically <laughs> see why I'm back. And those guards had said, these masks are not for you. They're for the islanders. And, and we had argued, but they had never got those masks. And later on, we heard that uh, anytime ministers visited or when the chief minister visited, it wasn't masks that they were um, asked to wear, but they were always accompanied with, uh, by guards with rifles. So I had that question, you know, why did those people refuse to wear masks? What did they really think about them? So I returned to the Shundurborn. Um, when I was at the London School of Economics, uh, I, I was there to do a master's and then a PhD. And I wanted to know why exactly they had refused to wear those masks. So I decided to do it on this region, uh, which was, you know, the Wild West for me growing up in Kolkata. It, it is a region full of completely incredible stories. So, um, so then I, I wanted to know um, why people had, um, had, you know, refused to wear those masks. And what happened when I went there? Uh, so I'm, a, I'm an anthropologist. I'm a social anthropologist. I, I, I'm interested in people's um, culture, history, religion, how they think of social hierarchy, how they think of um, caste, of kinship. So these were my questions. And um, every time I'd sit down to ask people um, questions, they would say, you need to go to the forest. And I would reply, you know, after a couple of times, I was kind of exasperated. And I said, you know, I'm not a tourist. I really don't care about the forest. I have come to write about you. And they would say, how can you write about us if you don't know about our forest? And, you know, when, when again, when a few people say the same thing, and they kept saying, you need to know about our tigers. And so I said, I've seen tigers. And they said, you have no idea. These are different tigers. These tigers are, are very special. And so from that point on, I started opening up and uh, getting curious about, you know, uh, what their tigers were about, how they saw them, how they, how they, you know, why were their tigers so different from my tigers? So this is uh, in a photo taken in Bangladesh, uh, where you can see one of these mud walls. And uh, there's a map of, you know, how far my hometown was from the island where I did field work. So um, it, is a, it is a very, very, so there is now a bridge. But in those days, 20 years back, there were no bridges when we crossed this river. And it was it was a nightmare crossing, especially if you had a computer and bags and you didn't want to get them wet. But um, so one of the poorest regions today, people from this region depend a lot on migration to make ends meet. Uh, they go to uh, richer parts of India, like Chennai, like Delhi, like uh, Kerala, and uh, they work mainly as construction laborers or domestic workers. So. What was very interesting when I started to learn more about um, their tigers was that their tigers were for them like brothers. And they kept saying that, you know, our tigers are animals that are very cantankerous and that is why they attack us. Um, and that's because many, many years ago when they lived all across Asia, they were kicked out and they would give us, give me a long list of names. Like they were kicked out of Singapore, of Taiwan, of China, of Hong Kong. And then they trekked and trekked and they finally arrived in the Sundarban. And this region was so desolate, um, no fresh water, um, 
that everybody left them alone. There were no humans. So tigers settled there. And, and, and actually, you know that one of the only reasons why you still have tigers in this part of the world, whereas you know uh, the British actually decimated most of India's wildlife through hunting sprees, especially the tigers um, and, and the elephants. The, the, the reason why the Sundarban was spared was because um, they couldn't go hunting on an elephant like they could in the Kumaon region of the Himalayas or elsewhere. You can't, you, can't, you can't go into a mangrove on an elephant. And as a human, it's very, very difficult to walk through a mangrove. Okay, you, you have a bit of mangrove in Pulaubin, you can try walking through. <laughs> it, is, it is really difficult. So anyway, um, they said, so these poor tigers were left all alone because this region was, was you know, such a, such a difficult place. And what happened was that when we arrived as migrants, as people running away from um, deaths, from um, exploitative uh, conditions elsewhere, tigers allowed us to settle and they saw us as brothers. So in a way we share the same horrible environment, the same very difficult environment, but we also share, share a sort of cantankerous nature. And this is often what people would say when I'd, when I'd ask why they were yelling or, or fighting with each other. They'd say, oh, it's just the air here and the water here, it's so salty. It makes us all cantankerous. Look at our tigers. Nowhere else in the world do tigers actually swim, you know they get on top of boats and they take a person and swim back with that person, okay? So they, they, they are young tigers hunting humans. It is not just old tigers that, that go for humans. So, so, so this was why they, they, they sort of had a very interesting way of, of, of seeing their tigers as being, you know, uh, as having had some sort of, um, um, influence by the environment they lived in. And this influence was shared with humans too. And it, it made them cantankerous, but it also made them compassionate towards each other. And I found that really interesting, you know, to, to, to kind of understand this, this, this idea that, yeah, they can be violent, but they also can be, um, you know, they can be sharing, they can be compassionate. So, um, so for me, I had to learn, uh, you know, what a what what an animal meant from the Shundalbon Islanders' point of view. Uh, I had to understand, um, you know, they had they had a lot of tiger charmers there, and I had to I had to understand what they meant by a tiger charmer, who became a tiger charmer, why did they become tiger charmers, what were the stories around uh, tiger charming as well as this little local uh, uh, superpower deity goddess you know I, I i refrain from calling her a goddess because she is not worshipped but venerated by muslims too um and so it is it is a, it is an understanding of the non-human where it is not a Judeo-Christian understanding where nature is below culture. It is one where, as Philippe Doscola was saying in, in the Amazon, where he did work with the Atuars, you know, it, it was a relationship of animism. One where you were part of this world, not one where you saw yourself above this world. You, you didn't see yourself as a human needing to control and living off non-humans. No, you really saw non-humans as having as much claim to, to the forest and to the environment as, as you, a, a human. So uh, these are just some images to give you an idea of um, what the place looks like. And these were taken 22 years ago with not a very good camera. So I'm, I apologize about the quality of the photos. Um, and so, uh, you know, in, in this photo, People are uh, collecting crabs uh, and collecting firewood. And in here they're collecting, they have these uh, mosquito net kind of uh, square nets. And they, the women pull them uh, along the, the river banks to catch uh, this tiger prawn spawn, which is just as, as, as thick as a hair. 
and about an inch long, which they then sell uh, so that it can be cultivated in, in ponds across the region. Uh, and what you have to be very careful of when you enter the forest is that uh, you cannot be surprised by low tide because if your boat gets stuck in low tide, you, you are just tiger food. So you need to leave the forest before the tide um, goes down. So, you know, you have to calculate uh, when you go in, how you come, you know, where you stay, which parts of the forest you, you navigate and all of that, because you don't only have to be careful about tigers. A lot of people have permits, but some of them don't. And uh, if you are caught, you have a very hefty fine to pay. So um, you have to be very careful about, um, you know, spending some, some time there. So uh, this is the, the superpower uh, Bone BB that I was telling you about. And, and the story of Bone BB is that she is sent by Allah to save people from tigers, uh, especially one particular tiger that actually used to be a Brahmin um, sage that suddenly started to pine for human flesh and for that took on the form of a tiger. And that creature is called Dukhin Rai. And so Dukhin Rai starts basically feeding on humans and bringing in a reign of terror. And Allah in his compassion decides to send this young woman called Bonbibi to save people from the tiger. But what happens is very interesting. She goes to the, the forest and, uh, and, and basically she rescues a little boy who is going to be killed by uh, Lokin Rai, uh, this, this uh, you know, um, human flesh eating um, um, tiger. Um, so as she, uh, so, so basically uh, Bon Bibi, rescues this little boy, sends her brother to, um, to beat up uh, the tiger. And he runs off to a friend of his, the Ghazi. And that's, that's in reference to an older story from the 17th century. And the Bone Baby story is only two, 300 years old. But what happens, uh, he runs to this Sufi saint who then tells him, you know, she is a good person and you should perhaps ask forgiveness and um, ask her to be uh, your mother. So Dokkin Rai comes back along with the Sufi saint, you know, who's protecting him and tells Dokkin Rai uh, not to, not to um, beat him up. And as they arrive in front of, uh, you know, Bon Bibi, um, Dokkin Rai says, mother. And she says, listen, this little boy has just called me mother too. So now I have two sons and you are brothers. So your responsibility is to look out for each other. And there is a long list of rules that are then sent out where humans cannot enter the forest if they don't have pure hearts and empty hands, which means you can't enter the forest with firearms. You can't enter the forest if you own something, if you own land or if you own gold or, or if you basically have another way of making a living. And if you are entering the forest in a truthful way, you're not killed. But otherwise the tiger kills you because you've not respected her injunction. And to this day, every time I return, I, I try to go there uh, once a year, except that I haven't been there in the last two years, as you can understand. Um, every time somebody gets killed, the islanders always find an excuse uh, in relation to greed or in relation to violence. And I find it very, very interesting that they still say that. Uh, so, Bonbibi uh, brings a kind of understanding, a truce between humans and tigers. And so the two are sort of linked in a complicity um, and, and uh, have to look out for each other as brothers. So these are more recent images. Um, and how are, what are we doing for time? Not much. <laughs> um, and, so, and so this is what I, I worked on you know, this, this idea of a complicity. Uh, what kind of complicity can, can we speak about when that creature is a, you know, a, a, a creature that can kill you? Um, 
And so this is where I got interested in this scholar's work, as well as in Molly Mullins and Donna Haraway and, uh, you know, uh, Shiva Ramakrishnan, who wrote a lot on the environment in India, Mahesh Rangarajan, Ram Guha. So all these people, uh, environment was becoming uh, something important in the in, in the early 2000s, late 1990s. So, you know, I, I got interested in uh, how do people make sense of animals in various parts of the world? And so how does this reveal something about the kind of people we are, which is what Descola says. We have different ways of perceiving wild animals or, or the non-human and the environment. And that tells us more about the kind of people we are. And, and he says, for example, he has four different ways, but the two types of understanding that I find very interesting are what he calls naturalism versus animism. And in naturalism, it is the Western way of understanding nature, where you control nature and where you, you basically think it is there for you. And he says that cultures that have looked at non-humans through the lens of naturalism have ended up colonizing other people because they feel that they need to control uh, their well. Whereas uh, and people who have lived in an animistic kind of understanding of uh, non-humans and nature have never tried to control anybody and have never colonized anybody. So, uh, you know, I, I, I find it, uh, interesting to, to think with. Um, these are some images I have, you know, Bengali is written like English or French from left to right, but for the booklet that is read out in her honor, uh, when people venerate her, Bengali is written still from left to right, but the book starts from what we would consider the end, like an Arabic book, uh, to emulate the fact that, you know, she is sent by Allah. And so, there are a lot of stories also of Sufi saints who have um, inhabited various, uh, who, have, who have converted people and uh, made uh, many parts of Bengal Islamic. And a lot of these stories involve the Sufi saint, you know, with a tiger. Uh, and, and so the, the connection between Islam here, you know, is perhaps more important than to Hinduism. Uh, so these are some uh, photos I took uh, in Bangladesh uh, when I was there. And what I want to also uh, tell you is that what, what I find incredible all over South Asia, really, you have many shrines and temples where you have a space for the non-human. So this is, for example, a shrine in Chittagong, where um, there was this magical pond and you had to feed some pieces of bread um, on, a, on a little uh, stick to these completely endangered endemic turtles. And this was the only place that they had survived because everywhere else they had been killed. And basically these turtles were believed to bless you. And they were linked to this, uh, to, to Hazrat Bayezid Bostami's uh, shrine. And it was mainly uh, Muslim uh, communities who came to this shrine to sort of be blessed by these turtles. Um, you, you similarly have temples where you have uh, uh, these turtles too in, in Assam, but all over, all over uh, South Asia, you have, you have shrines where you have crocodiles or snakes or a particular tree that is uh, very important. So from this, I got interested uh, more in the history of uh, partition and migration between West Bengal and Bangladesh. And so my second book uh, was co-authored with Joya Chatterjee and Claire Alexander. And together, so I spent two years in Bangladesh looking at um, the history of migration and who had migrated into Bangladesh and for what reasons. So it wasn't, uh, migration from Bangladesh or from East Pakistan into India, but the migration that had happened from India into uh, what was then East Pakistan. Today, I, uh, I have been living in Singapore for the last nine years, and I have uh, been very interested in how people understand the culling of uh, crows and cats, and I recently wrote a chapter on this, um, because I, I 
feel that it allows me to look at other issues, uh, perhaps issues which are not very easy to talk and write about, um, issues about indigenous histories, about colonialism, about the link to subaltern communities, the link to single women. It is, um, and so, and also, you know, how this city space, this, this, um, this garden city actually thinks its relationship to nature. Um, and, and this hyper control of anything uh, that grows is completely fascinating for me. So um, this is something I've been writing about. And more recently, I'm interested in understanding um, China's relationship to non-humans, perhaps because of the pandemic, perhaps because of uh, a lot of connections between uh, China and Bengal. And I, I, I want to look at uh, ways in which, uh, so you see this, this uh, the Sufi saints that converted Bengal, you have many images that were found from a little earlier than that. Uh, so from the 10th, 11th uh, centuries in the Dunghuang caves about uh, of monks with tigers. And many people have, uh, you know, Try to understand who these monks were, you know, how were they traveling. So I'm, I'm interested in a broader history of uh, monk travels with tigers uh, across Asia. So this is what, and so as I was saying, you know, because of illnesses caused by zoonoses, I've been very interested in understanding the moral, ethical ways in which we understand our relationship to the wild, to nature, to non-humans. You know, if in India, non-humans are very often considered as avatars. You don't, you don't kill a non-human very easily. In China, a thousand years ago, elephants and tigers were exterminated because they were seen as pests. So it's just that there are very, very different understandings of, you know, and in China, uh, amongst the elite, you try to uh, eat uh, certain body parts of animals. Um, in, in South Asia, that is not the case. The more elite you are, so the more vegetarian you are. So there, there are uh, very different understandings of relationship to nature. The Jains, for example, uh, you know, more than 2000 years ago, were thinking about life and uh, we're not even eating anything that grew under the earth. Uh, so no root vegetables, not just because it would kill the plant, but also because it would destroy the ecosystem around the plant. So, um, you know, a very, very interesting, uh, you know, relationship to uh, the environment and how we think of it. And also, so today, you know, how do we rethink futures with non-humans? And what has happened in the last two years is that I've been very fortunate to, uh, so these are some of the pieces I have written and you can find them, you can download everything uh, on academia.edu under my name. And um, I, will, I still have, yeah, but I don't have any time, sorry. But very briefly, what I've been doing in the last um, year and a half, uh, a little more than that, is that I have been working um, in collaboration with many wonderful groups. And it has been such a learning experience for me. So the first was um, um, writing this grant proposal with Aarti Sridhar, who heads the Dakshin Foundation in India, and uh, Rapti Siriwardane and Alin Tatpak. And so together we wrote this, uh, this grant proposal for the Southern Collective and we got uh, funding for it from uh, the SSRC, uh, the Social Science Research Council, which is in the US. And it allowed us to do a lot of very many interesting uh, projects. So we have a C lexicon uh, done by one of my students uh, who has collected a lot of um, indigenous ways in which people understand coral, for example, understand the coconut tree in the Lakshadweep Islands. Um, you have some stories of connected ethnographies. Uh, you have you have you have a lot of um, uh, pieces that Arthi and I uh, curated from uh, various academics on what it means to be doing 
ethnography today when we are all locked up in our little spaces where we cannot really move, at least uh, not us in Singapore, it's been very hard to move. And, um, and so this is one of my projects. The other project that I got funding for, unfortunately, we have not been able to work on it, uh, would have been, and, and is still in the pipeline. It's with uh, Professor Amina Mohamed Arif from the CNRS and the CIS, and together we want to look at um, Muslim communities, do a comparative study between uh, South India and uh, Bangladesh and West Bengal. So this is still, as I said, you know, uh, something that I look forward to do. And the third thing, um, and I'm very grateful to Mariana Losada for having uh, alerted me to this grant, is uh, how do you teach? What is uh, you know how do you teach the non-human to students? And for that, um, with Mathieu Ke and Marim Aldada, and uh, from here Vinod Saranathan and Arati Sridhar, who brought all of us together, we have been looking at uh, not just building an Asian bestiary, but teaching about the non-human in, in South Asia, in Asia. So I have a course called Beasts, People, Wild Environments. And in there, I've got my students to write a lot of, um, a lot of, um, um, they, they, they have all picked an animal and have written about the animal and how that animal can, can cure us or make us ill. And they have looked at PCM or Ayurveda. And yesterday, what we also did was we organized this big, um, but it was closed doors, um, um, webinar between, and conversation between Webi uh, Hotsun Yen and uh, Naiza Khan, uh, two wonderful artists. And um, so we were, we were you know, thinking deep with the non-human and uh, we invited uh, 20 artists to, to, to give us work around the non-human that they were doing. And they sent us that and we have the web website on. So you can uh, take a look at this. The website is still under construction. So it's not fully, fully out there, but in another 10 days, it should be out. So this was yesterday's webinar. And um, as you can see, these, these graphics and, and uh, drawings were done by Maida Chandez Avakian, and, and she is really amazing. Uh, so, so this has been my relationship <laughs> and my, uh, you know, my engagement with the non-human over the last uh, 20 years. And thank you for listening. And this is now open for you to ask questions. So I shall. Yeah, th thanks, Anu. It was uh, very interesting. And thank you. The picture was very nice. So I think you have a few questions already. You can have a look. Yeah. Great. I have a few questions already. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, it's uh, Bon Bibi. I can write it down. B-O-N-B-I-B-I. -I. She is amazing. The only goddess I believe in. Um, Dokkin Rai is uh, Dokkin Rai is the the, the shape shifting Brahmin human flesh eating tiger. And uh, Sarita, thank you. Man. I had a question in in Marine Conseil for deities like what? I'm sure she could pro provide scope of dialogue. But you know, uh, uh, Sarita, if I may, I'm just calling people by their first names. Um, uh, perhaps what would be best would be to look at what people in that region um, say about, you know, uh, supernatural deities they might have. So I know that in other parts it is uh, Ma Ganga, you know, who is on a very strange animal, which is kind of like a gharial. Um, and a fish. And so that's the veneration that they have. So Bon Bibi, she is very, very specific to uh, the Shundarbon, but in other parts, there are other names. And I think, yes, you know, the West Bengal government has very smartly caught on to the fact that, uh, you know, like entities like Bon Bibi can, uh, can, can, can give us uh, 
conflict resolution strategies and can, can offer conflict resolution strategies. And in the Shundurbun, yes, it has been done. And now she has become hip in more and more government offices. You know, 20 years ago, um, they would they would relegate Bon Bibi to, oh, those are the, you know, the islanders, those are the goddess. And they would have Makali uh, because, you know, she was, she was more urbane, she was more cosmopolitan, more known. But increasingly, people are having now Bundibis in their um, government offices in the Shundurbon because everybody has heard of her, and uh, uh, she, you know, um, she's she's sort of become, yeah, sexier than what she was. Just wondering if there is any other question. Yeah, you can uh, raise your hand or yeah. We have uh, one question coming from uh, Tabassum Zanam. I know, Tabassum, it's also something that astounded me, which is why uh, I, I really wanted to, to see for myself uh, shrines that were venerated um, by, by Muslims, you know, and so there is at least when I was doing there, I was doing field work there, uh, both in Bangladesh and in West Bengal, there was unease both amongst the Hindus as well as the Muslims in relation to Bon Bibi. And so I was working with a Hindu community in the, in the beginning and they kept saying, she's a Muslim goddess. What are we doing worshiping a Muslim goddess? Because you know, the whole book is about Allah sending her to save, to save tigers. And in Bangladesh, she was venerated as an image by the Hindus and people would not, you know, say uh, that, you know, they, they venerated her out openly uh, when they were Muslim. But I found a lot of shrines where um, you had nothing. It was sometimes an open shrine the way I, I, I showed you. And sometimes it was just a little shelter with three earthen mounds inside, nothing else. And people had left some flowers and some sweets because she's vegetarian. And uh, the, the things you offer Bon Bibi are uh, fruits as well as little live chicks. So you go to the forest, if, if, if you ha are worshiping her in the forest, you release little live chicks into the forest. Um, so, so that's how you, you, you venerate her apart from reading out her whole booklet. So yes, it's, it's, it's really astounding to see that, you know, Allah would choose a young woman to go and control this, this crazy, uh, you know, Brahmin, um, called Lokhin Rai, who takes on the form of a tiger. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's a lot more work needs to be done on this. Yes, thank you. Any other question? Oh, um, I'm just going to unmute. I raised my hand, but um, yeah, super interesting. Definitely would like to understand why why do why why do people give live chicks? Is there a specific reason? And what is the what is kind of the power of that goddess? Like, does she protect? people when entering the forest or does she have any other uh, roles? So she uh, protects people uh, when they enter the forest. Mm -hmm. So she protects you if you're a little guy, if you are not greedy. So it was very interesting because, you know, I showed you the, the images of those women um, pulling their uh, mosquito nets, right? In, in the water to collect tiger prawn. So tiger prawn was spoken about in terms of it being a kind of lottery. Uh, so you were never sure if, um, you know, you, you, you were never sure if you would, you would still survive um, uh, because you had a lot of crocodiles, but it was not something you did collectively. You individually caught your tiger prawn. 
And so they kept saying, only we is not good for us because it's a lottery. We may make a lot of money, but we may also lose our lives. So we need a, a stronger goddess, somebody like Kali, who is worshipped by, hang on, listen well, by policemen, taxi drivers, and poachers. So she's the goddess that these women were starting to worship when they decided to collect tiger prong. But for those who were going into the forest, Bon Bibi was the person we turned to. <clears throat> and so her uh, festival is usually mid-January, sometimes mm -hmm. mid-February too. And she is worshipped um, She's worshipped there um, at, at that time. So, um, and live chicks, I really have no idea, you know, why live chicks? And I think it's this idea of life, perhaps. And similarly, they said, you know, we need to give her fruits, but we, we shouldn't cut them. And we can't put a door in front of her shrine because she needs to get out quickly and go save people. So she saves you if you call her with devotion. Um, and as I said, if you're not a poacher or if you don't have firearms, if you, uh, and so, you know, I, I very, very naively when I first went there, <laughs> I uh, was once introduced to somebody, so the, the family with whom I lived, they said, you know, this guy, he's, he's a big poacher, and so he's in the forest all the time, so you can ask him all the questions you want. And I stupidly said, does Bon Bibi protect you? And he said, which government gave her the lease of the forest? Remind me, which government? He was like, so you're being sarcastic here. He said, why should I believe in her? How can I believe in her? I'm a poacher. I, I believe in Kali. So I thought, you know, he was maybe an atheist or whatever. And he's like, no, I believe in Kali. She's stronger. I'm a poacher. I need her. I need, I need somebody who is, you know, bloodthirsty like Kali. Um, Bon Bibi is not good enough for me. You know, she's, she's okay for the little crab collectors and the fishers, but not for people like me. So Bon Bibi protects when you are a crab collector or a fisher, also because you don't get into the forest, you stay on your boat. However, uh, when you're a honey collector and, a, and somebody who goes into the forest uh, to collect firewood, then it becomes a lot more dangerous. And then you need to be very, very careful about the way in which you maintain the rules of the forest. So for example, you cannot piss, urinate, or defecate on the forest uh, because it's sacred land. You cannot leave uneaten food in your boat before going to the forest. Uh, you cannot have beaten up your wife or yelled at somebody before going to the forest. You cannot have any, uh, you cannot have lent or borrowed money. Um, and you know, you, you have to be very, very careful. And you need the goodwill of your wife uh, if she is not coming along, if she's at home also, because, because it's such a dangerous thing. And so you really need to be completely under Bone Bibi's protection. But what I found um, quite incredible is that people kept saying, and, and this is something that I had read in the British Gazetteer, uh, you know, writers' works. They kept saying that this goddess is somebody, uh, they, they, sorry, they said that, uh, you know, these people believe in tiger charmers and they're the first ones to get killed. So, you know, how good are these people if they're the first ones to get killed? And when I, so I, I got interested in tiger charming and what it means. And they, they kept saying, the tiger charmer is the first one to get killed because the tiger charmer becomes a tiger. To be able to be a tiger charmer, you have to take on, you know, the arrogance of a tiger. Because if you do not take on the arrogance of a tiger, you cannot control the tiger. You cannot. So, so how did you control tigers? You controlled tigers by making it feel drowsy, making it run away as if his body was on fire, uh, making it ticklish. So there were all these charms which the tiger could use, the tiger charmer could use on the tiger. And then, so they were the first ones to get off the boat, 
to touch the earth and do their charms. And then when everything was uh, safe, they would tell people to get off. And then they also had the moral responsibility of making sure that once everybody came into the boat, they were the last ones to get into the boat and they had to break the charm or the spell that they had cast. And so, you know, they're the first ones to get out of the boat. They're the last ones to get in. You know, uh, chances are that they are the, the ones that are going to get killed. But, but they saw themselves as that, you know, and, and a few of them told me, yes, I was. And then something happened and I stopped being a tiger charmer. Uh, I don't want to take that risk anymore. I've, I've lost that arrogance. I've lost that, 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 you know, that ability to be able to stand up to these uh, animals. And again, this is not something that is passed on from father to son. Anybody can become a tiger charmer. And once when I had asked one of them if he would initiate me, he said, yes, you leave. I, I also used to uh, work as a school teacher uh, in, in the local school. And he said, you abandoned your, your job as a school teacher and you stop eating crabs and uh, shrimps because otherwise you'll go deaf. Um, and then I can initiate you uh, to become a tiger charmer. And it was very interesting that for them, gender was not an issue. There were a couple of women tiger charmers too. So, so this was um, something that I, I found incredibly interesting. And so the kind of mockery that I had found in British texts on the tiger charmers was finally explained when I was there by people saying, of course, they're the first ones to get killed. They are like sacrificial victims, you know? They, they take on the job of standing up to the tiger. So this is why they're the, they're the ones to, to get killed. So I found that interesting. Um, so <laughs> the, the relationship between uh, Singapore and uh, the natural and animal world, so what I found for me, what was interesting uh, was to ask my students what their, you know, how did they think of the wild or, and so I had some stories of uh, students going to fish very early in the Macritchie uh, waters. And they said, we always released the fish because that's not food. Food is what we buy in supermarkets. And I found that very interesting. The other thing that they said was that um, Singapore is perhaps, is, is the only Asian city where you will not find a crow. Have you noticed? There are no crows here. You go to any other Asian city, it is full of crows. And, and, and it's not just because it's so hygienic, it's also because there, there has been massive crow culling where you know nests are broken down and all of that. So it's not just crows that have been routinely shot at, but also nests. So I was interested to know what the students thought about that. Um, also around SARS, um, a lot of cats were culled and I wanted to know, you know what the students thought about that, what, what they had to say, what people had written about the cat culling why, for example, a cat is not allowed in an HDB. You know that you, you are not allowed to own a cat if you live in an HDB. So it, it is, you know, it is a, it, so, so these are the, and, and, and yet nature has been used by many alternative groups to sort of, you know, stand up to the government and say, so, so, I have been looking at all of this. Also, the uh, the the agritainment farms of Kranji, which are more for entertainment than you know actual farms, where you get more vegetables coming from Australia than you do from Singapore. So, I it's 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 around that. It's around the construction of of nature in this um, city state and and how people basically stand up to the city state by using um, nature again, you know, whether it's uh, fighting for the Bukit Brown um, cemetery 
or whether it's been for a whole lot of other spaces that have been taken over for um, construction purposes. So, uh, yeah, have bone babies palas. You know, uh, Purba, bone babies palas have become more popular because now you cater to the tourists. But something that would be a whole a, a night long event is now something that just lasts two hours, you know, because they've sort of cut down the story. Tourists can't stay up the whole night listening to these uh, theatrical plays. Um, so they just they just do, you know, make it into a two hour show. So in a way it's become a lot more, uh, yeah, popular. Um, the, yes, this week is dedicated to Goddess Durga. A vehicle is the tiger in the western part of India, but in the eastern part of India, where I come from, it is the lion. And Durga is always shown in Calcutta uh, on a lion in, in most families. Um, so today is the ninth day, and uh, tomorrow will be the very sad day when she, after tomorrow, she returns and goes back to her uh, father in the Himalayas, uh, her, her husband in the Himalayas. And so it is, um, it is a big, uh, it, is, it is perhaps the biggest festival of ephemerality, you know, art appears and then, you know, for, for six days and, and then completely disappears from, from the city life. But it's uh, something I think everybody should see once in their life. Um, so if a tiger kills to the worship of one baby and trust in her protection wane, it depends because as I said, you know, uh, two years back, I was, I was in the Shundarbon at exactly this period in 2019. I was there in August and September. And, um, and what I found, uh, there was somebody I knew very well who was about my age who got killed. And people kept saying he had an NGO job. Why did he need to go to the forest? And I was stunned to hear the same kind of arguments 20 years after I had done field work, you know, to see that people were still saying that he had been killed because um, he had not respected forest rules in a way. So uh, I think that, you know, on the contrary, uh, those who go to the forest really like have a lot of devotion for her. Um, yeah. So any last question before we end? And I see Mariana is here. Thank you again, Mariana. Yeah, th thank you, Anu. He was um, he was very good. A uh, lot of stories. I learned a lot tonight. <laughs> it's, it's, very, it's very interesting, and uh, it's like you're traveling, <laughs> traveling through uh, India, Bangladesh. Yeah, very nice. Thanks. Um, th thank you again, and um, thank you all participants for this after lab tonight. Um, I just would like to um, also recall that we have um, a quick survey also. Uh, you will see the survey also in the in the QA also as well. It would be good if you can respond to the survey. Uh, yeah, before we end, I think, Nicola, do you have any question? I saw you raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Just, just I think that was a clap. <laughs> ah, it was a clap? That's good. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I'm confused with the clap and end, but uh, no, it was very interesting. <laughs> this one is like, yeah, it's like more like, you know, <laughs> yes. So, yeah, thanks again, Anu, and thanks again, the team and for all participants for this after lab. We hope to see you soon in our next after lab in November. Um, yeah, it would be good if you uh, can take two minutes to respond to the survey as well. And 